All right, we're going to start out this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, we've been putting messages on sermon audio now for over two years. And this, we don't have any messages specifically on this topic. <clears throat> and a lot of churches, you're going to get this every couple of months, if not, you know, every other Sunday. But I want to talk about paid ministry this morning. Okay, now I'm not going to be begging for money, so relax, you know, all that. But Amen. I've been I've been kicked a couple times now by some of the brethren out there that tell me because I sell videos and because I take donations, gifts from people, that I my ministry is not legitimate. I've had a couple guys say that. And they'll quote some verses where Paul is talking about not taking money, but they take them totally out of context, and I'm going to show you that this morning. Okay? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 3. It says here, Mine answer to them that do examine me is this, Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Now, the word forbear, you can kind of infer what it means there, but I want to actually read from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Here are a couple of the definitions. Forbear, to avoid voluntarily to decline. Definition number two, to abstain from, to omit, to avoid doing. Uh, learn from the scriptures what you ought to do and what to forbear. And then the example given, it says, have we not power to forbear working? They actually quote the verse there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Definition number three, to spare, to treat with indulgence and patience. Number four, to withhold. Okay, what does forbear mean? It means basically to not do that, that thing. And what's in context there, have we not power to forbear working? Now, it's kind of funny because what Paul's saying is he's not saying that they're not working, that there's no work to being in ministry. There's actually quite a bit, and I'm going to get into that later. But he's saying we have power as ministers to forbear working, to avoid having a regular job. That's what he's saying. Paid ministry is not wrong. Okay. Now, as with anything in this world, you can take something and you can twist it and turn it into being wrong. I mean, that's just how it is. You know, people can take advantage of the system. And again, we'll see that in just a little bit here. But look at verse 7. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Now look at the first one there. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Oh, uh, well, that has actually happened a couple times. I know it happened some in the Revolutionary War. And I re do remember hearing some that even during the Civil War, there were troops from down south especially that were very poorly funded. And they didn't have much food. They didn't have much ammunition. And there were numerous times that they'd be in battle and they'd run out of food and they'd run out of ammunition. <laughs> and you got a whole string of troops that don't have any powder, any black powder, any shot, you know, any bullets we would call them, you know. They just... Muzzle loaders back then is a little bit different. But the point is, they're out of ammunition. Why? Well, because they went to war of their own charges. They went with their own rifles a lot of times and their own ammunition. And when you get in war, you're doing a lot of shooting and you go through your charges very quickly. See? And what happened as a result? They lost the war. <laughs> Why? They were poorly financed. And up north here, of course, we had all the big banks and everything and the whole agenda there, you know, if you want to be technical, constitutionally, the North was wrong, okay? Uh, it was about states' rights initially, and then they made it about slavery, another issue. But the point is, they went to war of their own charges, and they lost, okay? Look at the next one. Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? If you have a man that starts a ministry, and that ministry starts to bear fruit, which the Bible talks about, spiritual fruit. Is it not right for that man that started the ministry, that planted the vineyard, for him to take something of that fruit? 
You know, if the ministry is doing well, what's the guy supposed to do? You know, I mean, I'll be very honest with you. Having a regular nine to five job and doing ministry on the side, you're not going to get it done. There's a lot of work that you're just simply not going to get done. Okay, and we'll see that. Like I said, there's I'm going to be filling a lot, filling in a lot of this stuff as we go on. Okay, um, or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Okay, a one of the jobs of a pastor is to feed the flock of God. Uh, we're going to see that here. Turn over, keep your hand there in First Corinthians chapter nine because we're going to be coming back. But turn over to First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five verses two through four. Actually, we'll start at verse one to get into context here. You have Peter writing. It says here, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now, of course, you see the thing there, not for filthy lucre. That doesn't mean not for money. It just means not for filthy lucre. There are ways that you can get around things and pervert the scriptures and teach things which you shouldn't be teaching, and you'll make a lot more money doing it. Okay, you see these big mega churches that are building multi-million dollar buildings? How are they doing it? They're entertaining people. It's filthy lucre, exactly. Okay, it's not the same thing. And see, a lot of people will take those big churches and they'll say, that's paid ministry. See, that's why it's wrong. I don't agree with Benny Hinn and all this stuff. That's not the issue. It's what the what the what does the Bible say? Verse three, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. There is spiritual reward for a pastor, but you will see the thing of a pastor should be, you know, compensated for what he's doing, for the work that he's doing. Okay, and a good thing that you could say too is if you go to a restaurant and you get a meal, and it's a really good meal meal and really filling, would you walk out without paying a bill? No. You would say, hey, I appreciate that, you know, whatever. Okay? And we're going to see that this is not a rule, a standard rule, that it always has to be this way. I'm going to show you some things here as we continue. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 8 through 10. Okay, say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? This isn't just Paul's opinion. This is actually written back in the Old Testament. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Okay? Uh, God's not writing livestock manuals. Okay? You know, it's not just an instruction for an ox. And it's kind of interesting, too, because in a way, a good preacher is kind of like a good ox. Okay? An ox, if you want something that moves really quickly, you don't want to pick an ox. Okay? A horse can outrun any ox out there, <laughs> you know? Even a donkey could probably outrun an ox. What's an ox do? They are steady. They move forward at a steady pace. That's the way it should be in ministry. If you have this meteoric rise to fame, you get really popular really quickly as a pastor, that's bad. That's real bad. The Bible talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 3 about a novice being lifted up with pride and falling into the condemnation and snare of the devil. Why? Grew too quickly. And you'll see that. Some of these, especially among the charismatics, they have you know, very little sense in these matters. They'll get a teenager and they'll say he's a preacher. I know that there was a, an article in our newspaper here. A, a black woman was a pastor of some church and she had her grandson preaching. <laughs> you know, totally inappropriate. I mean, it, there's no argument there. 
And what happens? Well, they get lifted up with pride very quickly. And they fall into the condemnation and snare of the devil. That's what happens. You don't want to rise too quickly. You don't want to plow too quickly. You just want to be nice and steady and slow and just keep moving forward. That's the way it should be. But if the ox, you know, if the farmer has the ox and he's plowing the field and he's doing a good job, what would happen to the ox if the farmer said, well, I'm not going to feed you? It, he'd die. He wouldn't be able to plow the field. That's what's being written about here. Okay? And Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, by the way, is where it's written in the law of Moses. We're not going to go there. I'll just read it. It says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. So, there's your Old Testament reference. Uh, now let's look at verse 11. It says here, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So right there is where you have people start saying, Ah, see, paid ministry is wrong. No, it's not what it's saying. And I'm going to show you that here in just a minute. But, you know, it says there in uh, verse 11, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Okay, no, it isn't. I'll tell you right now, it takes a lot of work to to be in ministry. And <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, but I work harder now than I ever did before. It's crazy. And, you know, there's no such thing as time off. I mean, you have to force yourself to take time off. You know, I remember hearing Lester Roloff the one time speaking, and he said about how the there are times he's only getting three or four hours of sleep a night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not even close to being on that guy's level yet as far as in contact with people and, and even spiritually. But the point is, I can see that coming. You know, when you start getting email after email after email, many, many of which, you know, you spend an hour answering somebody. Yeah. And, you know, I've had a lot of people ask for my phone number. They want to call and talk. I don't give out my phone number. Why? I don't have time. <laughs> you know, I did, and I had a brother that would call, and he'd just talk and talk and talk for like an hour, you know. And, and you know, I'd get in maybe five words the whole time. And he, he needed to talk. He needed to talk stuff out, whatever. But I can't be doing that. I mean, anyways, let's continue on here. <clears throat> We're going to see about this thing of why Paul didn't take money from the Corinthians. Verse 13 do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? <clears throat> That's specifically a reference to the Levitical priesthood in your Old Testament. A lot of times they were sacrificing an animal, and then they were actually eating part of that meat that was sacrificed. Okay, they were... It wasn't, you know, they're there, you know, doing the sacrifices. Oh, man, I didn't see the time. i got to get to work, you know. No. They were ministering about the things of the Lord. They were there continually. Full-time ministry. Paul's referring back to it. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that were written, a full-time that are written for our learning. Okay, It's not that we are now in the New Testament, so you scrap the whole Old Testament. There's a lot of application there. you know. But it takes study. Right division of Scripture. That's why a lot of people don't want to do it, because it takes work. Okay, You have to study the Scriptures. Uh, verse 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. It's not, well, our church tradition is that you should pay a minister or you should pay somebody in ministry. That's not it. The Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So it's of the Lord. So these people that say there is no such thing as paid ministry, uh, you really need to do a little bit more study. But let's look at verse 15. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done, so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. Why didn't Paul take money from the Corinthians? Because they would make his glorying void. They would use it against him. And there are situations that you're going to run into in ministry 
where there are certain people you shouldn't take money from because they will try to control you. Um, a good story that I heard one of my sermons I've listened to, I actually have a tape of this. There was an evangelist, I guess he's still around, I know he was having some health problems, Cliff Burwell was his name, and he has a sermon, and he was talking about, he used to be a pastor of a church, and he said there was this very wealthy man that would come up to him after every Sunday service, and he'd shake his hand, and he'd have a $100 bill in his hand, you know, that's for you, preacher, you know, and, and he said he did this for a number of weeks, and he said the one week he gave him the $100 bill, and he said, uh, hey, by the way, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of like to meet with you sometime. You know, I'd, I have some suggestions, just some suggestions, you know, about some of the stuff you've been preaching, just just some things I'm a little concerned about. And Cliff Burwell said he took that $100 bill and he gave it back to the man and he said, I'm sorry, brother, but I'm not for sale. And he said that guy never came back after that. That was it. See, there are certain people you shouldn't take money from. And that's all Paul's saying right there. Okay, the Corinthians, it's amazing when you when you look at the whole thing, Paul wrought the signs of the apostles among these people. He should have been highly respected, and yet they were constantly undermining his authority, constantly questioning. That's the whole purpose of what he's writing about here. They were they were coming against Paul and saying, Well, what about this and what about that? And well, he's taking money and oh I don't you know. And that's why Paul said, I'm not going to take a cent from you people. I'm going to preach to you, and you should still preach to people like that, but don't take any money from them. No way. You know, there are ministries out there that have approached me about, you know, oh, we're really happy with what you're doing and stuff like that. I don't want anything to do with them. I'll write back, well, thank you, you know, goodbye. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with certain ministries out there. I'll give you a good example, the Prophecy Club. If I, they haven't contacted me yet, but if they would ever contact me, I know some Bible believing brethren have gone and done videos for the Prophecy Club. But those guys are messed up doctrinally, big time. They have some very strange, charismatic stuff that even mainline Pentecostals wouldn't go along with. I mean, they have some weird stuff. And if, you know, oh, but you can really get big quickly, I don't care. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with people like that. You know, I'll write to them, communicate with them, fine. But I don't want anything to do with them. I don't want to take any money from people like that. No way. And even YouTube. They want to put ads on some of my videos because the videos are getting very popular. No thank you. Oh, but you could make a lot of money. You could, you know, every time somebody clicks on your video, you can make money. I don't want lost people having rights to my videos and putting their advertisements on my videos. And if that eventually gets me kicked off the internet, well, okay, fine. But I'm not going to take money from people like that. Not going to happen. Okay. Did Now the question comes up. Here Paul is not taking money. But was there ever a time when Paul did take money? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Uh, Greg Miller... Uh, pastor out in Ohio. He's on Sermon Audio and he's on YouTube. He preached a really good message on this recently. The Macedonian Mindset, it was called. Highly recommend listening to that. It was very, very good. But uh, we're going to see about a group here. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Notice a couple things there. They had deep poverty. And yet, the riches of their liberality. They were very liberal in their giving. That's pretty incredible. Okay, and look at verse 3. For to their power I bear record. Wouldn't that be something to impress an apostle like Paul? <laughs> I mean, you talk about a spiritually powerful man, Paul, and he's saying, these people are incredibly powerful, spiritually. 
I mean, that's that's really something. You talk about a a, a great thing. Uh, but let's look at another verse or another scripture here. Luke chapter twenty one. I'm going to show you a similar thing here. Luke chapter twenty one. The Lord Jesus showed a very similar situation. Okay, Luke chapter. 21 verses 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. Now, if you are making a million dollars a year and you give away a hundred thousand dollars, there are a lot of churches that would love to have you as their member. Okay? But what if you get some woman that's homeless that comes in, to put this in a modern day perspective, she's homeless and she comes in and she's got five dollars, we'll say. And that's the only money that she has. And she puts that into the offering. Which one is more spiritually powerful? The poor woman. Why? Because now she has to rely on God to provide her needs. Okay? If you are making a million dollars and you put a hundred thousand in, you know, your ten percent, you really don't have to rely on God. You still got nine hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> you know? But if you put in all that you have, and I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, don't. So many people that are listening, you're probably saying, oh, he's begging for money now. He wants to put, us to put all of our money in. I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to show you the type of believers that God will bless. Okay, that's all I'm doing here. Just talking about paid ministry, if it's right or wrong. Okay, but right there, it's very similar to the Macedonian Christians. Okay, they were poor, and yet in their poverty, they were giving liberally. Okay, that doesn't mean they were political liberals either. Uh, but let's continue here. Philippians chapter 4. Turn back to Philippians 4, verse 10 through 19. And this isn't going to be a super, super detailed study. There's a lot more scriptures we could get into, but you know, I'm not going to make this an exhaustive study or anything else. We're just going to hit a couple more spots and then we're done. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You know, if you're self-employed, you'll understand that scripture pretty well. I mean, depending on what you're in, there are some people that have a normal, regular clientele that they uh, deal with. But even somebody who's self-employed is going to understand that thing there about I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. <laughs> you know, when you have a regular nine to five job, you're getting a paycheck regardless of how hard you work. Okay. And there are a lot of people that milk the system and they don't do the work that they should and they're still getting paid. When you're self-employed, if you take it easy and take a break, you don't get paid. <laughs> and I've been self-employed for a very long time now. And, you know, I was in wood turning. I worked in logging a little bit, firewood processing. And there were days I just was sore. I didn't feel like going out and working, whatever, which is fine. You can do that if you're self-employed. But then you don't get any money. And the harder you work, the more money you make. See, totally different thing. But in ministry, it's also there. Okay, it's at least it should be. All right, you get into a big church. A lot of these big church pastors. I mean, I know of a church, a uh, Methodist church down in Lampeter, and the pastor there has a paid-for house, and he's making seventy-five thousand a year. And you know what? It reflects in his preaching. Okay. His preaching is sissy. I'm sorry, there's no better way to, to say it. I mean, he doesn't preach on sin. He doesn't preach against new versions. He uses a new version. You know, he uses the NIV. You know, it, it's just 
let's grow the church, let's get money coming in, we need to build onto our already huge church, we need to put in things for the youth, large screen TVs and DSL and uh, Sony PlayStation 3s and all this stuff. I mean, I, I had a friend that was actually going there, and he quit because he said, he said every Sunday it was money, money, money. Give to the, give to the building project. Give to just give, 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 give. And you got a guy up there that's making seventy five thousand dollars, and he was telling people in the congregation to get a second or a third job to help finance get a bigger building. And how many times is that repeated every Sunday? How many times is it going on right now across this country? A lot. And see, I understand. I have grace for the brethren that attack paid ministry because they see that. They see the big salaried guys that are making... I mean, there are pastors in this country that are making millions of dollars a year. Find that in the New Testament. <laughs> you know? And you know, if a pastor's doing right and he's and he's really doing good things and stuff like that, maybe he deserves that. Okay? Maybe if he's really working hard, okay, fine. But you and I know these guys aren't working like that. You know, they're going on gospel cruises to the Caribbean or something. Anyhow, let's continue. And this is another thing that's important too when you're in ministry. Uh, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. A very important verse you should have memorized. Verse 14, Notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction, now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, there you have Macedonia again, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. I found that kind of interesting. He's over there preaching in Thessalonica and somebody comes up and taps him on the shoulder. Yeah, hey, here's a gift from the, Th the uh, Philippians. <laughs> Here's your support from the Philippians. Okay, and, and by the way, I just want to make a point too. And that is, it doesn't necessarily say money. Okay, you assume that that's what it is. There are other ways that you can help out in ministry. Okay, if you're listening and you say, man, I barely have enough to pay my bills or whatever, and whatever else, there are other things that you can do to support somebody that's in ministry. Like, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay, verse 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. That's interesting right there. Paul's not saying, you know, I want to get rich. Let's increase the giving so we can do it, get great things done for the Lord. He's not saying that. He's saying, when you people are sending me a gift and it's enabling me to stay in full-time ministry, it's actually abounding to your account. You know, it's interesting because, you know, you, you hear these, these great missionary stories, guys going to Africa or something like this, and they're really getting the work of the Lord done. And you say, man, I bet that guy's going to have great reward in heaven. Wow, I wish I could do something like that. But I can't. I just can't. My situation, I can't go to Africa as a missionary. But you can. If you give towards that man's work. You see a good ministry, and you say, man, there's a lot getting done there. Hmm, I wish I could be part of that. I can. I can't have a ministry like that, but I can give money towards that thing. And I can actually have some of the fruit that comes from that ministry, it'll return to me. It's kind of like investing in a stock. You know, you see a company that's really booming and really doing good, and you say, I'd like to buy some stock in that company. Why? So that it will abound to my account. Same sort of thing. Look at verse 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. You know, it's kind of interesting. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay? Your body is to be, to be presented as a living sacrifice, so does God expect less from your money? It's right there. Verse 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. If you are giving to a ministry, God's not going to let you sit. God's not going to let you be bankrupted. Okay, You will have heavenly reward, but you will also be rewarded here. 
in this life. God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Yeah. Needs, not wants. Yep, I understand that. Now, we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. This way. What type of ministry should you support? That's the next question. You just see a, a Christian ministry. Oh, I'm going to send them you know, my tithe money or however much. No, you've got to be careful about that. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 says here, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now you say, what's the double honor? That means respect? Well, yes, but there's more than that, because it's defined in verse 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So it's defined. If we go back to what's said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Okay, 1 Corinthians 9, 9, if you want to be specific. They're about the, you know, mouth of the, or the, not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Okay, but now look at the qualification there in verse 17. They who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, you can see when a ministry is laboring in the word and doctrine. I've gotten on some church websites on the internet or ministry websites and they'll say about us, you know, or our beliefs or whatever. And you click on the thing and there's like four sentences. And it's so anemic, it's like you really can't even figure anything out. We believe the word of God is uh, inspired in the original or something like this, you know. Well, what is the word of God? Define it for me. What Bible do you use? Well, you can't find anything like that. You know, we believe that Jesus Christ died for men's sins and and uh, we believe in the eternity of, of heaven and, you know, and that's like it. I mean, there are ministries that are like that. But then you get on some websites, you get into some ministries and it's just like, it gives you a headache almost. I mean, just article after article after article after article. And it's not, you know, we're linking to this website and linking to that website. It's stuff that the guy's written. And you'll see that. You know, a great example of that, and this is a ministry that I would recommend, you know, I have a few minor issues with the guy, but for the most part, he's right on, and that's James Melton. Uh, what's the, uh, is it Bible Bible Baptist Publications or something like that? Yeah. And you, and you, I mean, get the guy's catalog. He has got sermons on so many different issues. He's got tracks. He's coming out with tracks all the time, booklets, just just information, information, information. What's going on? He is laboring in the word and doctrine. That stuff takes time. <laughs> I can attest to that. You know, so when you get on in, into a ministry, look and see, are they laboring in the word and doctrine? And if so, there's a legitimate ministry. That's one that if you put money, you know, if you buy stocks <laughs> in that ministry, it's going to return. It's going to abound to your account. But if you see some big, huge church that all they're worried about is making their building bigger, don't invest any money in that. Don't invest in buildings. Okay, that's that's a really bad idea. Okay, that's just a thing there. Okay, and of course, another little story here quick. I remember we were in Alaska the one time and we went to this big mega church that I had relatives going there, and the pastor, quote-unquote, got up and he read his whole sermon. And the worst part of it was, it wasn't him that wrote it. It was some book that he was reading from some famous, you know, Chuck Swindoll or, or one of these guys or something. And he just stood up there the whole time and just, da, 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 just read the thing. And you know what? The size of that church, I bet that guy was probably making 100000 or more a year. I can almost guarantee it. Now, did I give anything to that church? No. <laughs> Will I ever? No. No way. Okay? That's not the kind of ministry that you should give money to because it's not going to return anything to you. You know, except for a tax rebate at the end of the year. Another issue. Uh, of course, he was a salaried pastor. Another issue. Now, there are three qualifications that I would say a ministry must meet 
before I will give them a cent. Okay, and and by the way, I just want to say this too: being in ministry doesn't exempt you from giving back to the Lord. Okay, for a while I kind of struggled with that. You know, well, the money I make is going into my ministry, and blah blah. blah. No, no, I've kind of gotten convicted about that, and so there are ministries that I give money towards, and I'm not trying to make a thing. Oh, look at me! I'm super holy for doing it. I'm just simply saying. Everybody should find some ministry to quote unquote invest in. Okay, and I don't mean that in a carnal way. I mean that spiritually. Number one, they must use and believe the King James Bible. They must. Okay, I will not support a ministry that is not King James Bible believing. Why would you want to help a ministry grow that's using the new versions? <laughs> don't give them a cent. Okay. I mean, they're supposed to be labor, laboring in the word and doctrine. Well, how can they labor in the word unless they're using it? Okay, don't give anybody that's that's not King James Bible believing, don't give them a cent. Number two, they have to be right doctrinally and working hard to get the word of God out. I remember I heard a thing from uh, Dr. Ruckman the one time, and he said that is the ministry publishing the word. And I think that that's a very important thing. Are they publishing the word? Are they putting out tracks? Are they putting out videos? Are they putting out sermon CDs, sermons of any kind? Are they interested in getting the word out? Or is it just a thing of, we just want to do nice things? And, and do you have any tracks? Well, no, not really. You know, I mean, most churches that you walk into, they don't even have tracks. There's no track rack there. There's no mention of tracks. Nothing. Or if there are tracks, you walk up to them and they're like these old ones from the 1970s and they're all like brown from age. <laughs> you know, it's like nobody's getting them out, you know. The only people that take the tracks are, you know, visitors to the church or something. You know, you might get a Bible believer coming. But number three, and I said this one, got kind of got ahead of myself, are they publishing the word? That's very important. Okay. Uh, is there clear evidence that they're doing something for the Lord? And if there is, you know, help them out. Second Corinthians chapter nine. This will be the last place we turn to this morning. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses six and seven. And like I said, this is, you know, this will be the last place we turn to. It says here, but I, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Notice it does not say, or of necessity, for God doesn't expect you to give. It doesn't say that. God loveth a cheerful giver. Okay, going back to my little analogy of investing in stocks, there are things called penny stocks, where you literally just put a couple cents in. Now, what kind of a return are you going to get on your investment? Not very good. You know, I made a quarter this week, you know, or something. Our, our, my penny stocks did really good. Okay, how much are you investing in missions, in ministries, and things like that? How much of your money do you invest in that? Okay, and I've been convicted about it too. I, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, oh, give, give, give to the ministry. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying I'm, I'm preaching to myself right now too. There have been many times where I make money and the Lord doesn't get a cent, and that shouldn't be that way, you know. And I'm convicted about that, and I'm trying to get better with it. Okay, it's very important, and you should do it out of a cheerful heart. You should say, that ministry over there has blessed me. I really appreciate that. I really like the work that those guys are doing. I want to see that thing grow. I know that when I send them my money, they're going to put it into ministry. They're not going to build bigger buildings and crystal chandeliers and mirrored walls. I know that it's going to go back into publishing the word. You know, I want to see that thing grow. I mean, I think that would be a very important thing to do. Uh, a couple ministries that I would uh, definitely say it would be good to invest in, quote unquote, you know, invest in, give towards local church Bible publishers. 
Very good. They actually, I found out that they're actually selling their Bibles. I mean, they're making Bibles that are higher quality than Cambridge Bibles. I got a Cambridge Bible here. It cost me $110, and it's falling apart. And I've talked to, I think, two other brethren had the same Bible, and it fell apart at the same time. About 10 years after having it, the thing starts to come apart. The pages start to come loose. The binding, the, the cover, you know, starts to come apart. $110 for that? <laughs> and local church Bible publishers is putting out better quality Bibles, and I think their most expensive one is $55. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. You know, that's neat that they're able to get cheaper materials or something like that. They're not making as much. I found out recently a brother actually wrote to me, and he said, that he was talking to the founder, you know, the guy that planted the vineyard, of local church Bible publishers, and he said they're selling the Bibles slightly above the cost of the materials. Why? Why? How are they able to do that? Because of God's people supporting that ministry. That's how they're able to do it. And there are cases, I mean, I know a brother down in Texas, uh, and he, he wrote to... Actually, local church Bible publishers and Bearing Precious Seed. It's the same ministry, two different branches. But he wrote to Bearing Precious Seed and he said he does some kind of a boat ministry down there in Texas. don't know exactly all the details to it, but he said, you know, do you guys have some cheaper Bibles that I could give out? He said they sent him like six or seven huge big boxes of Bibles, tracts, everything, and didn't charge him one cent. How are they able to do it? Because of God's people supporting them. So that's a good ministry to get involved with. Jack Chick's website. Are they involved in publishing the word? Yeah. A lot of their books that they sell are available for free on their website. You can go there and read the whole book. You know, All the tracks that they sell are right there. You can go, click on it, and it comes up the whole track. And you can read the whole track. They're not greedy. They're not saying, you can't take anything that we have. You can't see anything that we have. I mean, I, there are websites out there that are putting out articles, Bible-type articles, and you have to subscribe to them. <laughs> you know, and a lot of them, you're paying a monthly fee. And there again, I'm going to kick Prophecy Club. There are different levels that you can be a partaker in the ministry. The platinum partaker level is $1,200 a month. Who has that kind of money? Twelve hundred dollars a month to be a platinum partaker. And back when Hurricane Katrina hit, I got this letter from from Prophecy Club, and they said, "We know that people are suffering down there, but you can't forsake the kingdom of heaven. So, please keep your donations coming in." I thought, <laughs> boy, that's <Yeah>. kind of <laughs> kind of a crooked thing to do there. I mean, geez. Bad news. James Melton, I said about him earlier. You know, there's a ministry that, and by the way, here's another very good point, especially on James Melton. When you get a, a catalog from James Melton, it's not a full collar, glossy catalog with smiling pretty girls on it, okay? It is a computer printed out paper. Here's the tracks that we have. Oh, by the way, here's what's going on in the thing, and, and you know, Here's a good article. Here's a letter I got. Here's how you refute it. He's publishing the word. And the stuff that he puts out, it's made at a low cost so that you can distribute it and get it out. You want to buy his booklets, they're not going to cost you 10 or $15. You know, If you buy 1000 we'll give you a 5% discount or something like this, like other ministries I've seen. No, it's very cheap. Okay, We give out a lot of his information. I know a lot of other Bible believers do too. Good ministry. Uh, Ruckman, he's public. He's publishing the word. That's another good ministry. You can get a lot of stuff from Doctor Ruckman. You know, I have some issues with the Bible Baptist Bookstore, some of their copyright stuff. But you know, there's some argument there back and forth. You know, some people do take advantage of it. I understand that. Okay, um, but there are good ministries out there. Are they publishing the word? Are they laboring in the word and doctrine? Are they King James Bible believers? You should do something about that. And let me just say this, too. If you are interested in, in doing that, if you're under conviction right now, and, and like I said, as I have been, you need to realize that 
you only have one life to do this. Okay? Invest now, because when the rapture happens, the Antichrist is going to get your money. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, don't have a huge storehouse of, of money down here. You know, it's just going to go to the Antichrist. <laughs> Especially if it's in the bank, okay, because it's not real money there anyhow. It's just digital. So it'll be absorbed into the system. Okay, uh, now I just want to say, I've been attacked on this thing now um, a couple of times, and I've been told that I've been lazy. Okay, you got into paid ministry because you're lazy. You're not, you know, willing to get a real job and all this other stuff. I had a guy write that to me. Let me just say this: I have worked in some very physically demanding jobs, and they are simple compared to being in ministry. Okay, back when I was logging, logging is considered the most dangerous job in North America, followed closely by a commercial fisherman up in the Bering Sea. You know, it's that's dangerous too. But you go out and you work hard, physically hard. You're exhausted when you come in at night. You're, you just sweat like crazy and, you know, very physically demanding job. But you have an appetite that's great. When it gets to be nighttime, you're tired. You can sleep like a log, as they say. You know, it's great. I miss logging. Okay? I'm not lazy. I like to log. I, I used to sell firewood. I, I would do about one to two cords a day, which is, you know, really moving when you're sawing and splitting by hand. And I was doing that. I was selling firewood. Again, very physically demanding, I, and I loved it. You know, and there have been times when I remember the one time it went for quite a few weeks and I didn't sell one DVD, you know. I mean, and, and the, the same guy was saying that I should be giving away my DVDs. You know, it's like, Okay, how am I going to finance it? You know, they cost me money to make. You know, I mean, let's be reasonable here. Um, but there were times when I would work very, very hard and you sleep well. Now in ministry, there are times it'll be three or four hours before I can go to sleep because I got emails that I'm thinking about or some guy's attacking me and I'm thinking, okay, how do I answer this and whatever? I got to put together a video. There have been times I've worked till four o'clock in the morning in ministry. And it's just all the time, all the time. Believe me, ministry is not easy. Paid ministry. Now, there, are there easy ways to do it? Yeah, sure. Some of these big TV evangelists, they're taking the easy way out. Absolutely. You know, don't confuse the two. Okay? It's just crazy. And by the way, I just, I'll just say something else here about, you know, for those out there that are attacking me personally, for the you know, I don't care. I mean... I get attacked so much now, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm not, my feelings aren't hurt or anything. You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. But just for the record, if you're thinking out there that I got into ministry so I could make a lot of money, you're crazy. <laughs> I used to be an artistic wood turner before, before and even while I was doing my logging work. There were times that I sold a wooden bowl for anywhere from four to $600, and that bowl took me an hour to make. And I quit that to get into ministry so I could make money. Wrong. <laughs> I made a lot more money as an artistic wood turner, and I was getting more and more and more popular, And it, but I was getting miserable. You know, that I, could, I should probably do a testimony thing sometime, get into that more. But, yes, you should. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the fact is I, it was a very, I was getting more and more popular. I was getting into, invited to some of the biggest art galleries and art shows and everything. You know, coming as a visiting artist and all this stuff. They wanted me to come demonstrate. And I, I gave up all that stuff. And it's not, you know, oh, man, I sure miss it. You know, I can, I can relate to Paul on that. I count all things but dung. <laughs> and I do. All the, all the awards and everything and all the... Oh, you're such a talented artist and everything else. I see you going great places. Pfft. Doesn't mean a thing to me anymore. Okay? But I didn't get into ministry for money. That's not the motive. There are some that do. Don't confuse them with the Bible believers. Okay? As I said, this sermon is not a plea for money. It's a plea for you if you are not giving to a ministry. Get that thing straightened out. Okay? Don't have to send money to me. Just pick a good Bible-believing ministry and support them. Okay? It will return to you spiritually in heaven, but also God will bless your life down here. Um, may I 
say something? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Your comment. I, I wanted to make sure that I got this in here because if you take a look on our website and stuff, Sermon Audio, you're going to be finding that I did a message on giving. And mm -hmm. Brian and I aren't contradicting. All I was saying is there's no scriptural precedence that you are required to give 10%. Yeah. But if God lays it on your heart to give five, you give five. If God lays it on your heart to give 40, you give 40. Mm -hmm. Remember? So I, I want to make that clear. Yeah, that there's no contradiction here. There's just yeah. no scriptural precedence that you have to give 10%. Excellent. Yeah, we're, we're going to have a big debate after this whole thing's over. We're... <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's good. You brought that up. I wanted to mention that. I forgot to write that on my notes there. Yeah. The, the thing that was being kicked there in the, in the unscriptural tithing thing is that the tithe itself is oftentimes forced on people and your salvation is questioned if you're not. And all you're this in stuff. sin, local, brother, if you don't give 10%. Church, too. Yeah, yeah, to some the local church. After that, but they, some preach that 10%, that 10% bonds in local church that you're mm -hmm. some of them. Yeah, yep. yeah. Chapter and verse. You know, and a lot of times, you know, you might be going to a church that's not really publishing the word, not really getting anything done, but man, brother, you got to have that 10%. Mm -hmm. You know, and I even heard the, a story the one time a guy told me that there was a church he went to, some big, huge Methodist church, and if you weren't giving 10%, they would put your name on a bulletin board. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. They'd put you on a list. They'd blacklist you. Mm. <laughs> you know, shame you publicly. Because you're not giving your 10%. That's what that message was about. That's what, what Jesse was kicking. Okay. So, yeah, there's no contradiction here. Um, you know, I'll just say one other thing before we close here, and that is the Bible says you're to do all things in moderation. Okay. You shouldn't have a forced tithe, and you shouldn't not give anything. The right thing is right in the middle. Moderation. Not too far to this side, not too far to that side. Give to a good ministry. Okay. Find a good missionary, find a good ministry, and support it. That's it. Okay, so that's it there. If you have any questions, as always, please contact us, ask us the questions, and we'll try to get back to you. Thank you for listening.